Good morning. My name is uh, Stefano Salvatore. I'm a gynecologist from Milan in Italy. I've got the pleasure to introduce uh, the state of the art lecture of this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce the invited speaker, Mr. Rufus Cartwright. He's a trainee in gynecology in, uh, in London, in UK. He undertook his uh, first doctorate supervised by Linda Cardozo on the outcome measures in overactive bladder and his uh, second doctorate su supervised by Vicular on the genetics uh, uh, in incontinence. Uh, he serves as an editor for the BJOG and uh, also for the International Urogynecology Journal. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to invite him to the microphone. His uh, speech today will be on the genetics of the lower urinary tract dysfunctions and the promise for a stratified medicine. Please, Rufus. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be able to give this talk in front of so many people whose work I admire. Uh, I don't have any disclosures to give, except that my travel here was funded by a grant from the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation. In this talk, I'm going to give some insights from family studies and twin studies, the results of meta-analyses of the candidate gene studies for lower urinary tract dysfunction. I'm going to talk about the new risk loci that have been identified from genome-wide association studies, and I'll end the talk discussing some routes towards stratified medicine in this area. A little bit about my background. I think uh, when Cara Tenenbaum kindly asked me to give this talk, I was at the top of Mount Stupid here, knowing not enough about the topic, but a little bit too willing to agree. And hopefully, as I prepared the talk over the last year, I've slipped down into the subsequent valley. As Stefano said, I'm a gynecology trainee in the UK, and I worked initially in clinical trials and clinical epidemiology. And then over the last five years, I changed more to work specifically in the genetics of incontinence in women. And in this talk, I'm going to be mixing in a little bit of our own research with what's been happening in the field overall. When I told people I was going to work in the genetics of incontinence, some very sensible people thought I was insane, and that was a terrible idea. And fundamentally, that's because many people don't believe incontinence is a disease at all. You may think this is an uncommon thing, given the society we're in, but actually this lovely slide comes from Carrie Tikkanen. And he went out to ask every Finnish member of parliament and a large number of doctors, nurses, and laypeople in Finland what they, th what they thought were and were not diseases. And so, in the top left, you can see things that everyone thinks are diseases marked mostly by green bars, breast cancer and prostate cancer. And down here in the bottom right, you can see things that no one thinks are diseases, smoking and wrinkles. Uh, there's OEB in the middle, sandwiched between lactose intolerance and work exhaustion, and nocturia affairs even worse. It's here in between insomnia and social anxiety disorder. So many people don't think incontinence is really a disease, they just think it's a symptom. And I believe that if we understood more about the genetics, we would go quite a long way to establishing it as a true disease. The second problem is that people don't think incontinence is important. And I think that's even underestimated in this audience. Uh, this slide comes from the Global Burden of Disease Survey 2010, published by some colleagues at Imperial. The slide shows every country around the world as a pair of dots between a red dot in 1990 and a blue dot in 2010. And on the x-axis, it shows how life expectancy changed around the world. And with one exception, which is Haiti in the bottom left, every country improved life expectancy over that time. However, to give one example, which is the UK, we've done something very stupid during those 20 years, which is to increase life expectancy, but equally increase the number of years we live crippled by disability at the end of life. And among the things that cause disability, incontinence and BPH are remarkably important. Here's the most important diseases worldwide that years live with disability, and BPH is there, number 25th among all diseases for years live with disability. And if we look just among men, the situation's even more astonishing. In fact, in high-income Asia-Pacific, which I think means here, it's the second most important cause of years lived with disability among men, and fifth in Western Europe. So again, I think if we understood the genetics of these conditions a little bit more, we could go a long way towards preventing what happens to many of us at the end of life. Now, in this talk, I'm going to follow a sequence that's very familiar to geneticists in establishing that a disease is or is not genetic. We're going to look a little bit about how ethnic variation informs us of lightly genetic susceptibility. We're going to look at family studies and ask whether these conditions do run in families. I'm going to go through the classic twin studies that help disentangle genetic and environmental effects. 
I'll talk about the candidate gene studies, where you go out to look for just a few polymorphisms or one or two genes at a time, and then the genome-wide association studies that have revolutionized the field. So I think it's well known to many people that many low urinary tract diseases vary widely with ethnicity, and this provides some circumstantial evidence that there may be a genetic basis. For example, BPH, about half as likely to be diagnosed among African-American men. The same situation for female incontinence, with a large number of studies mainly from the United States that have compared rates of incontinence across women of different ethnicities. And broadly, you'd say that white women seem to report more incontinence overall, and particularly more stress incontinence. And there's some suggestion from studies within Europe that Northern European women are more likely to report stress incontinence, whereas Southern European women are more likely to report urge incontinence on average. So this gives some suggestion that all these things may have a genetic basis. However, there can be substantial reporting biases in, because people of different ethnicities may be very, very differently willing to report stigmatizing conditions such as this. And that's why family studies exist. Now, this slide shows in one second what a family study tells us. You take one look at a slide, at a wedding party, obviously, you can see who the groom's family are, who the bride's family are, and you know in one second from looking at them that height must be a highly heritable condition. The first person to ask this question was Henry Thompson. He was a house surgeon, a junior surgeon, working very near to where I work now in the 1850s. Uh, times were very different in the 1850s. By the time he was the most junior level of surgeon, he'd published three times in The Lancet. And this is one of those publications where he asks whether what he calls irritable bladder be a hereditary disposition or a condition acquired. And we can answer very firmly that it is a hereditary disposition. If you have an affected first degree relative, then you're somewhere between two and four times more likely to have the same condition broadly, whether that be stress incontinence, urge incontinence, or nocturnal enuresis as a woman. And we also see quite strong familial aggregation for prolapse, both anterior, posterior, and apical. The situation is a little bit different for male studies. We see very strong familial aggregation for BPH surgery. And actually, we've previously seen in the Swedish twin cohort a strong correlation seen for stress incontinence surgery. But that may be biased by different access to healthcare, different access to doctors. When you actually look at symptomatic BPH, the excess risks are a little bit lower, with an odds ratio of around 1.5 to 1.7. Now, many of us uh, may have been told about twin studies in medical school, uh, but it's not always that familiar to us. So this example uh, just explains briefly how a twin study works. It helps us, in a very precise way, disentangle genetic effects from environmental effects. So here are two sets of celebrity twins. On the left, the Weasley twins from the Harry Potter movies. Uh, they are identical twins. And on the right, the Olsen twins, uh, Mary, Kate, and Ashley. Uh, they're non-identical twins. Now, as you'll remember, identical twins share 100% of their DNA, except for some epigenetic variations. Non-identical twins share 50% of the variation. And for a twin study to work, they must be raised in very similar environments. So in this slightly silly example, we can consider separately hair color and occupation. Now, as should be obvious, identical twins will have identical hair color, whereas non-identical twins like the Olsons will have different hair color, at least as different as any two brothers or sisters. And from that, you can say that probably hair color is mostly a genetic condition, although there may be some hairdressing going on for the Olsons, I think, here. In contrast, you can think about occupation. And in this case, at least, these two sets of twins both have the same occupation. So non-identical and identical, identical twins are both equally likely to share the same occupation. And from that, you can say that occupation is po probably mostly environmental. Now, fortunately, people have gone out and asked exactly that question for most major lower urinary tract disorders. And we can say that heritability is really quite high for urgency incontinence, approaching 50%. That doesn't seem to be as true for stress incontinence. In fact, some studies report very low estimates of heritability, in some studies, 0%. And I think that's because during the child, childbearing years, parity and mode of delivery have such a dominant effect on stress incontinence and it's hard to do these studies really well during that time, uh, concordances tend to get higher after the menopause. For male LUTs, we see very high estimates of heritability, and you can say that BPH is at least as heritable as prostate cancer, something we think of as very genetic. So to summarize these studies, we see very clear familial aggregation for stress incontinence, urge incontinence, and prolapse. 
The twin studies suggest to us that urge incontinence is going to be more heritable than stress incontinence. And the situation for male LUTs is a bit unclear. We see quite low estimates of familial aggregation, but rather high heritability in the twin studies. So when I was setting out to work in this area, I had a sense that there were a large number of candidate gene studies out there, but I didn't know where they were, and I hadn't seen any summaries of them, so we set out to systematically review the literature and bring together all these associations to see what was and what wasn't a verified genetic effect on these conditions. And this is what our search strategy looked like to do it. At the top in light blue, you can see what I'll call the polymorphism words, the words for the different kinds of changes in DNA that people look at in association with the conditions. And of these, at the present time, the second one, a SNP, is by far the most important. That's a single nucleotide polymorphism, a single base change in a DNA. Now, typically in a candidate gene study, you identify one gene that you think is of pathological interest from prior, prior research, and then you try and find a SNP in that gene that you think changes the structure of the protein, and then you go and test to see if it's associated with the disease. These studies were enormously popular around the turn of the century, but then people began to notice that there were a lot of problems. Very, very often, these studies failed to, failed to replicate, and there were many, many ways in which bias could creep in. Now, rather like the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, there's a guideline for how to assess the quality of these studies and how to look for bias, and that's what we used. It's called the Interim Venice Criteria. That asks you, when you pull studies, a little bit like grade guidance, to look at the amount of evidence, the replication of effects, and the protection from bias, and it gives very specific advice about where to look for bias in studies. So for, for us, we recalculated the power of each study, because these studies are typically many times too small, and we rechecked for study sources of bias and for publication bias at two different levels. And the short answer is that we all know almost nothing from candidate gene studies. There's this SNP in the beta-3 adrenal receptor. That's obviously a gene of interest because of Mirabegron, and RS4994 is a common SNP, uh, particularly common among Japanese populations. So we have two studies, one from Japan and one from Brazil, and they show identical effect sizes, a very large effect, more than doubling the risk of overactive bladder with moderate credibility. There's this SNP in the promoter for collagen type 1, alpha 1, which, as you can see from these two forest plots, is suggestive of having a reasonable effect on both prolapse and stress incontinence. The most famous variant in the field is probably this, the CAG polymorphism in the androgen receptor, the most studied variant, certainly, in functional urology. It shows something on this forest plot that's very, very common across the field, which the initial studies showed quite convincingly and with reasonably large effect sizes that there was a big effect in this variant in causing uh, BPH, and subsequent studies, for the most part, completely failed to replicate that effect or showed effects in the opposite direction. And so overall, in our meta-analysis, there's no effect. We do, however have some suggestive evidence for a variant in LAC2, a complete deletion of the GSTM1 gene, which is surprisingly common and markedly increases your risk of BPH, and this variant in the vitamin D receptor, again a coding variant, which with moderate credibility appears to quite considerably, odds ratio of one and a half, increase your risk of BPH, again with moderate credibility. So to summarize the candidate gene studies, despite a huge research effort, more than 100 papers in the field, this hasn't produced robust results, and that's the same right across medicine. We do, at the mo this moment, have moderate epidemiological credibility for variants in ADRB3, the beta-3 adrenoceptor, in collagen type 1, alpha-1, and one variant in the vitamin D receptor gene. Well, what's gone wrong with these studies? Well, it's pretty slow progress. There are literally millions more SNPs out there that need to be assessed. We found a very high risk of publication bias for the field as a whole. It's impossible to find negative candidate gene studies, and that's quite unlikely because, as I said, they're very substantially underpowered, almost always. And so in aggregate, they're producing low credibility evidence, and that's why the field has moved on to a genome-wide approach. So you may not have heard of a genome-wide association study, but you've almost certainly read about them in the popular press. When you see a silly story in the popular press about a new genetic effect, it's almost always come from GWAS. This very silly one from the Mail Online, don't like coriander, the reason could be in your genes. If you've sent your DNA off or your patient's DNA off to 23andMe, that's essentially what consumer genetic testing is doing well. They're running GWAS on your DNA. Now, GWAS has many problems as well. The first thing is it requires huge sample sizes to compensate for multiple hypothesis testing. But it's worthwhile because it can provide novel insight into physiology, pathology, and treatment. 
Now, as a quick reminder of what type 1 and type 2 error are, GWAS has terrible problems with both of these. The problem with type 2 error is at this moment intractable. There are very many, very uncommon variants across the genome with tiny effects on the major common diseases. And for the most part, those are undetectable even with the largest possible sample sizes at the present time. The problems with type 1 error can be addressed. If you assess millions of SNPs at the same time, the first thing you need to do is set a very stringent criteria for significance, and that is accepted across the field now. And the second thing is that you must always replicate your results. So no result on its own can stand without replication because of the problem of type 1 error. So we'll now talk about the GWAS in this field. And the pioneer in the field was Peggy Norton, and she conducted this first GWAS for prolapse, uh, published in the Green Journal in 2011. She used a design that was, uh, I would say, fashionable at the time, which was to use a relatively small sample size, but select cases with a very severe phenotype. So these were young women with early onset severe prolapse and with affected family members that she'd collected uh, from her own practice, and then she used population level controls. So in this analysis, they found six SNPs that reached what's called genome-wide significance. Now that's set at a p-value of five times 10 to the minus eight. That sounds like a small number, and it's a million times less than a p of 0.05 that we use in usual clinical practice. And that's because we believe there are a million different independent genomic loci across the genome. So Peggy had six polymorphisms reaching that important threshold for significance, but unfortunately with a very small replication set, she wasn't able to replicate those results. We have quite recently seen a subsequent GWAS on prolapse using a subset of the Women's Health Initiative data. So this is a, unusually a mix of African-American and Hispanic women, and essentially it's two GWAS in different ethnic populations at the same time. Uh, what we show at the bottom here is a Manhattan plot. It, the stripes are said to be like uh, the Manhattan skyline, and the peaks or the antennae on those Manhattan skyscrapers show where there is biological signal. And what we're looking for is to see the biological signal reaching across the top line, which is a p-value less than 10 to the minus uh, 8. In this case, in uh, this study using the Women's Health Initiative data, there were several loci reaching genome-wide suggestiveness, so that's equivalent in a normal clinical study to a p-value of, say, 0.1. It's, it's good enough, but we need more samples and we need replication. Holly Richter used a different subset of the Women's Health Initiative to look specifically at urge incontinence. Uh, here we're reaching a very reasonable sample size for GWAS, uh, 2,241 cases and unusually uh, rather fewer controls. Uh, so they used a split sample design to get over the problems with replication. They looked in half the population and then tried to replicate in the other half and then meta-analyzed between the two. And again, they had several SNPs reaching genome-wide suggestiveness and that gives a good indication that there may be future discoveries in this area. When we set out to do a GWAS, uh, I wanted to look at stress incontinence and urgency incontinence at the same time, because I thought they would have some common genetic variants and some different genetic variants contributing. And we used three large studies for the discovery phase. Uh, that's the ALSPAC study, which is uh, from University of Bristol, a huge study of uh, initially children born during 1991 and 1992, and we followed up all their mothers. Uh, we used uh, Twins UK, a collection of uh, twins from right across the UK, uh, identical and non-identical. Uh, obviously, we used all the non-identical twins and only half the identical twins. And then we used the Northern Finnish Birth Cohort 1966, uh, which was a collection of uh, almost everyone born in the northern districts of Finland during 1966, uh, housed at the University of Oulu. So from these three studies, we had just under 9,000 women with complete information. Uh, they were mean age 45, quite close to the peak age for incontinence, uh, median parity of three, quite Paris. In common with these other recent studies, we had almost 10 million SNPs that passed quality control. And in our Manhattan plot, you can see that there were 16 SNPs at five loci that exceeded that important threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus 8, and we had a further 88 genome-wide suggestive variants. Another plot that you need to look for when you read a GWAS paper is this one. It's called a QQ. On the x-axis, it plots the expected distribution of p-values given the number of different statistical tests that you're setting out to do. And on the y-axis, you plot how the p-values you actually got. So if you have no result, no biological result, then the black line of what becomes wiggly dots will stay within the gray null area, showing that you've just got a morass of type 1 and type 2 error. But in this case, we see what you want to see, which is some biological signal where our results deviate away from the null. So you should always look for this in a GWAS paper. 
We set out then uh, to try and replicate our findings, and I, I rang up many people in this room and emailed and got together all the people I knew with collections of DNA, and then went out to the big cohort studies that either had incontinence phenotypes or where we could ask for new phenotypes. And we collected a further 4,000 samples. Uh, we sent the DNA off for a competitive allele-specific PCR, and we were able to genotype the top 12 results. Uh, so here are the top 12 SNPs. I don't know how many are expecting to replicate, but two of the 12 convincingly replicated, and they're here highlighted in red. And so here, convincing replication means they had the same effect size as in the discovery cohorts, and after Bonifroni correction, they remain statistically significant. I'll briefly show the two forest plots. They look pretty good. There's low heterogeneity on both plots. You can see that the I squared number on both plots is zero. Now, the third plot that you need to look for when you read a GWAS paper is this one. It's a regional association plot. So this is like a very zoomed-in Manhattan plot. It shows a tiny part, in this case, of chromosome 2. Every dot on the plot represents a different polymorphism in this part of chromosome 2. And the genes in the plot are the little blue lines at the bottom. You can see our top variant is a purple dot right in the middle of the plot, and the height of the dots represents their significance. So here you can see that top variant and some other associated variants overlying a gene called EN1. EN1 is reasonable as a candidate gene for stress incontinence. Uh, it's quite uncommon, about a 1% rate, but it has a big effect in our study at least on stress incontinence with an odds ratio of 1.85. We found later that it wasn't expressed in adult human bladder, but in general homeobox genes are expressed in fetal life, and it may have a role in early bladder development. The second plot is a bit more sparse. It's a part of chromosome 6 this time. Again, you can see the top SNP in the middle, but it doesn't have any friends there. There are no known SNPs in high linkage to sequilibrium with it, and it lies in between two different protein coding genes. Of the two, this one sounds like a really good candidate gene for urge incontinence. It's endothelin-1. So our top SNP lies just upstream of endothelin-1. It's a rel relatively common SNP with a big effect on urge incontinence again. And we know that endothelin has a huge effect on smooth muscle throughout the human body and including in human bladder. And we've seen previous work in animals to show that endothelin modifying drugs affect detrusor contraction. So this sounds like a great candidate pathway. So we went on to look at gene expression, initially using a microarray experiment on a bladder biopsies from women with stress and urge incontinence. We found a large number of differentially expressed genes between the two conditions, including the M3 muscarinic receptor as the most overexpressed gene in urge incontinence. We went on specifically to look at uh, the endothelin pathway, and we found that all genes up and downstream of endothelin were expressed in adult human bladder, and seven of 19 genes in the pathway were significantly differentially expressed. So the overall pathway p-value is relatively small at 0 0.001. Okay, so we can take a bit of a breather now. That's the end of the heavy results. The rest of the talk is just mostly speculative about where we're going with personalized medicine. This shows points in time across the life course when you might want to apply genetic testing. But for the most part, for common complex diseases like incontinence, this is a field that just doesn't exist yet. Uh, President Obama's stratified medicine initiative, uh, the uh, genotyping going on in the UK, they're just not aimed at common complex disease. Mostly people are looking at rare disease and they're looking at cancers. But it's possible for the future and when we think about where we could go in urology or urogynecology, at least functional urology, we can think about using genetic testing to establish disease risk, or using genetic testing for disease diagnosis, importantly including disease subtypes. We can think about how genetic risk impacts on disease prognosis, and of course we can use genetics to understand therapeutic efficacy and therapeutic harms. So first, disease risk and disease prognosis. We all know very clearly that in theory, pelvic floor disorders are preventable, but our patients have a pretty hard time applying the lifestyle advice that we already give. Uh, this graph comes from our recent meta-analysis in European urology. It shows the huge impact of cesarean delivery in projecting against stress incontinence, but at least before the menopause. Uh, so we already have difficulty applying uh, lifestyle advice to our patients, and really across the field as a whole, there is no current evidence that providing additional measures of genetic risk helps people to improve their behaviours. In fact, there's some suggestion that the opposite occurs. If you tell people they're less likely to get a disease, then they may be more likely to go out and do the unhealthy thing. The second thing is disease diagnosis or disease subtyping. And this quote comes from Norman Zinner. It says something that I think many of us know already, that OAB is misleading because it makes it too easy for clinicians to feel 
they've made a diagnosis when they have not. In so doing, it curtails further thinking and does not promote the scientific pursuit of fact. I think many people in this room know that the diagnosis, if it is a diagnosis of overactive bladder, is in a mess at the moment. What we're doing for our patients doesn't always make good scientific sense. We ask about one symptom and we make a diagnosis. I think if we really understood the genetic basis of overactive bladder and the other conditions, we would have a really good route towards understanding the different subtypes of urgency and urgency incontinence that present to us in clinic, instead of ascribing them all the same diagnosis and typically giving them all the same drug. Now, pharmacogenomics is always said to be the area where we're going to make the earliest progress in personalized medicine, at least for common complex diseases. And the FDA already labels many different kinds of drugs with pharmacogenomics labels. They can relate to drug exposure and clinical response variability. They can relate to the risk for adverse events. In some cases, there's genotype-specific dosing. And for some cancer drugs, there are some drug actions that depend on previous genetic testing. Somewhat surprisingly, there are a large number of drugs that we already use in functional urology and urogynecology that have these labels, including tolteridine and fesoteridine, nitrofurantoin, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, they get used for bladder pain syndrome, and of course, when we have patients on warfarin that we manage perioperatively, this has many different kinds of warning relating to different susceptibilities and thrombophilias. It's my impression, at least in the UK though, that for the most part, people are unaware of these labels and certainly are not using genetic testing at the present time in order to stratify or tailor their drug treatments. Where are we going next for overactive bladder and LUTs? Well, I think we need to understand how the variants we've already identified fit into what we understand about disease pathology. We need to try and establish new treatments based on that new understanding of pathology. And both for existing treatments and new treatments, we need to try to predict which treatments suit which patients. As we know all too well, many of the drugs that we use in functional urology and urogynecology have very poor persistence because the balance of efficacy and harms is just not right for a majority of our patients. To conclude, genetics have been perpetually the next big thing for at least the last 25 years, and sadly the clinical advances, at least for common complex disease, have been completely underwhelming. I truly believe, though, that the novel loci identified in GWAS may offer new insights into pathophysiology, and we will have more of those insights as the size of cohorts with GWAS data increases over the next five years. Going on to understand the interplay of genetics and the environment should help us target our patients for primary and secondary prevention. But the take-home message of this talk is that for the present time as clinicians, we need to focus on obesity, delivery mode, smoking, and the modifiable risk factors for the conditions that we treat. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you very much, Rufus. This is, is an outstanding lecture. Uh, we've got four minutes for questions and answers, if it's okay. Although uh, despite the slide, I would like questions if there are any. Um, Kate Moore from Sydney. Um, very interesting, your results regarding the gene that relates to endothelin. Um, in, at this conference, there's been a lot of interest in the notion that um, metabolic syndrome may be a, a relation, have a relationship to DO. Um, do you think that could be the mechanism that, um, that with the metabolic syndrome that there's atherosclerosis and the endothelium isn't coping with that because they have a genetic predisposition to some peculiarity of endothelium that might, particularly with DHIC? Just wonder your thoughts on that. that that's a good thought. That would, be, that would be quite an indirect mechanism. If, if you believe our effect size, and uh, there is a problem of what's called winner's curse, that effect sizes tend to start large and get smaller, but if you believe the effect size that we found and it did stay consistent between discovery and replication, then it's a very large effect size by the standards of GWAS. It makes it unlikely that it would be such an indirect mechanism. I'm hopeful that the mechanism is directly in the bladder. We showed endothelin receptors being expressed in bladder, and I'm hopeful that we can apply a drug directly, although at the moment many endothelin modifying drugs are considerably toxic. Another question? Yeah, mine's simpler. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm Jeff Hardesey from the USA. I'm a urogynecologist. I just wonder if you have any uh, vision for the future. Do you envision a day when we can have a personalized uh, genetic testing that will tell us that this patient should have a vaginal birth and this one should have a cesarean to avoid the potential complications from her genetic background? Is that 20 years away? Is it 50? 
how soon must I retire? And uh, it's important. <laughs> that, that's, that's a controversial question. I think there's some people in this room that believe that everyone should have a cesarean birth. It has a substantial protective effect. And of course, we don't know at the present time uh, about environment by gene interaction. And that's often a very difficult problem to get to grips with. I, I don't think women will accept that testing within our lifetimes. I think it's a, po it's a polarizing choice. It's been impossible to conduct randomized trials of that issue. Uh, and I think in general, people are pretty reticent about the prospect of genetic testing, the disease risk. I am really hopeful, though, that genetic testing is going to sort out the mess of overactive bladder. It's, to me at least intellectually, very unsatisfying to see a woman with urinary urgency and have nothing more to do for her than say, you have overactive bladder, have an anticholinergic. I find that a miserable situation in outpatient clinic. I would like to be able to apply more diagnosis and have more prognostic tools at my fingertips. Good, it's nine o'clock. We're running perfectly in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, Rufus.